Um, welcome to another PQC seminar. Um, also given by another new faculty member. Actually, very new. I think Yuka uh, just joined the new faculty this this fall. Yuka is a theoretical condensed matter physicist. Um, he, I think, particularly specialized on um, topological quantum materials and multimodal topological quantum computing. This is obviously a very uh, major area of focus here at Purdue. In fact, Yuka came uh, from Microsoft Station Q. I think that's his previous place as a postdoc before he joined Purdue faculty. And before that, uh, he got his PhD in Yale University, I think. Um, and uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Is a Varina? I'm not sure my Finnish is. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, the Finnish okay. way would be uh, Vaurunen, okay. but Vaurunen is, is absolutely... Yeah. I think I'm topologically correct, hopefully, yes. Okay. Uh, all right, I think, uh, yes, uh, you can take off from here. Thanks very much. Yuka. Okay. Thanks, Young, uh, for uh, the kind introduction. And um, today I will tell you about some very recent work, um, which actually just appeared in the archive last night. And um, for students, if you are interested in this kind of work, feel free to contact me, for example, by email. And also if you have any, if anybody has any questions during the talk, just feel free to interrupt and, and ask. Um, here is the outline of my talk. Um, I will give a fairly general introduction and I will try to keep it very pedagogical. Um, those who saw my talk uh, at Purdue Physics Department in February will have seen uh, some of this, this first part. However, the, the second part of the talk um, will be completely new and, uh, and it's a different topic. So I hope you stay for that. So let me start from the very basics of quantum computing. We use uh, quantum bits or qubits and um, the power of quantum computing is based on the principles of entanglement and superposition. Uh, in these qubits. For example, instead of just uh, zero and one states uh, that you have in a classical bit, we can have arbitrary superpositions such as, as this one. And uh, there are many different platforms currently pursued to make qubits. On the top row here, I have uh, some examples that, that use an atomic degree of freedom to encode the qubit. And on the bottom row, I have uh, superconducting solid state systems where we use the collective degree of freedom formed by billions of electrons to, to make the qubit. And in this talk, my main motivating factor is this uh, uh, topological qubits. Um, the conventional qubits face some common challenges. Uh, qubits are essentially two level systems with a ground state and an excited state. And uh, the qubit operations are implemented by unitary time evolution between these two states. And there are at least two problems uh, with this approach. The first one is that this excited state likes to decay back to the ground state over time. And the second problem is that the operations of, uh, of the qubit require precisely timed pulses. If your pulse is, uh, for example, a little bit too long, uh, you don't achieve the gate operation that you wanted with, with full uh, confidence. Now, let me mention that uh, Despite these challenges, there has been uh, great progress in the field. For example, uh, this recent breakthrough from the Google group about a year ago, 
uh, they were able to get 53 transplant qubits. So uh, there are these crosses here. Um, they were able to get them to the level where the error rates um, or error probabilities are of the order of uh, one over a few hundred. And with this circuit, they were able to demonstrate the power of quantum mechanics and run circuits uh, whose classical simulation would take from, uh, from days to years on a supercomputer. However, to really scale up uh, quantum computers, we would need to get to error rates uh, of the order of one in a million. And that's the challenge that we hope topological qubits can, can help with. Uh, in topological quantum computation, we use uh, topological gapped phases of matter. Uh, these systems have can, uh, can have uh, degenerate ground states and therefore they would make an excellent qubit uh, since neither of these states can decay uh, as they are both ground states of the system. These topological phases <clears throat> can support exotic excitations known as non-abelian anions. And the braiding of these anions can be used to apply discrete uh, rotations to the qubit. And since the rotations are discrete, uh, there is no wiggle room to produce an error. In this talk, I will be focusing on Majorana-based uh, topological quantum computation, which goes back to Kitaev's work in 2001. Here we use uh, these so-called Majorana quasiparticles, which are essentially half electrons. Two Majoranas uh, make a single fermionic level, and uh, this level can be uh, either occupied or empty. And uh, furthermore, uh, the, the energy of this level will be exponentially close to zero in the uh, distance between the two Majoranas. Now this almost looks like a qubit, but it turns out that we want to have a qubit formed by the states which have the same number of electrons. And that you can do with four Majoranas. And the qubit levels can be, for example, these two in that case. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, you can do discrete rotations of this qubit by, for example, braiding uh, the Majoranas. I will now go through in quite detail the toy model of Kitaev, also known as the Kitaev chain. And this is a very simple model where uh, these unpaired Majoranas can appear. Uh, the model is a tight binding chain of, of uh, spinless fermions with nearest neighbor hopping, uh, chemical potential, and nearest neighbor p-wave pairing. And without this pairing term, the dispersion of this model is the simple 2t times cosine k, uh, shown here. And when we include the pairing term, it's useful to move to a Majorana representation and define uh, two Majoranas, gamma A and gamma B uh, for every fermion C. And this is a generic identity you can always uh, decompose a fermion operator into, into two Majoranas. One can, uh, so that effectively doubles the lattice sites because you have uh, two Majoranas now for every lattice site. And you can show that um, when the chemical potential is outside this band, so for example, up here, um, the ground state will have these Majoranas paired up in, uh, in an on-site way like this, and this is, um, this is the trivial phase of this, of this model. However, 
when the chemical potential is inside the band, um, the ground state will be uh, dimerized in different way. Namely, um, the, the Majoranas are paired now uh, with their neighbors uh, as shown here. And as a result, you have two unpaired Majoranas at the, at the ends of the chain while the bulk of the chain is, uh, is gapped. Uh, so at low energies, we can ignore the bulk and just have these two Majorana end modes. And next, I will discuss how to realize this model in, in two platforms, uh, topological insulators and uh, spin orbit coupled nanowires. Let me start uh, with the topological insulator platform. So topological insulators have um, these topologically protected helical boundary modes while the bulk is gapped. And helical means that the right and left moving modes uh, on a single edge will have opposite spins. So here, for example, the right moving mode has spin up and the left moving mode has uh, spin down. And when the chemical potential is in the uh, bulk band gap, this looks very promising because it's almost like the edge is a spinless system, meaning that um, we only have one species of fermions for each direction of, of propagation. And indeed, it turns out that um, if you proximitize this kind of edge with uh, S-Web pairing, then at low energies, this, this pairing looks effectively like, like P-Web pairing. And the model then becomes the, the same as uh, the Kitaev toy model and uh, and you will have the Majorana end modes in, in that model. There are also proposals to uh, realize Majoranas in uh, TI uh, nanowires, but I won't be discussing that today. The other proposal that I mentioned is a semiconductor nanowire with strong spin orbit interaction. So without spin orbit, we would just have a parabolic band of uh, degenerate, spin degenerate electrons. And um, if we <clears throat> have spin orbit interaction, these uh, bands will split as such. And furthermore, if I now uh, on top of that apply magnetic field, uh, perpendicular to the spin orbit direction, a gap will open up um, at this crossing point. Now, uh, if my chemical potential is in this gap, you see that I have again achieved what looks like uh, a helical regime, meaning I have just uh, one species of uh, right movers and one species of left movers at the Fermi level. And also these uh, right and left movers have approximately opposite spins. And once I proximize this with S-wave pairing, I again get effective P-wave paired system. Let me next discuss some NS transport signatures of this Majorana. Uh, end states. So NS means that we use a normal superconducting uh, uh, junction to, to do transport. Here um, I'm showing the nanowire setup again. The semiconductor is shown in gray and the superconductor in blue here. And at finite magnetic field, uh, you have um, you are in this topological phase um, 
and you can have the Majorana bound states at the ends of this uh, proximitized segment of the of the wire. And this uh, zero energy um, electron level that you form out of these Majoranas can now be probed by simply tunneling uh, electrons, tunneling current into it. So you can do it by, for example, uh, measuring the conductance from uh, this left lead to the, to the ground. And here I'm plotting the conductance uh, versus the bias voltage and the magnetic field. And at, at zero magnetic field, what you see is that um, there is no conductance at zero bias. Um, you have some conductance peaks at, uh, at bias equal to the superconducting uh, gap from the BCS density of states. Uh, but as you ramp up uh, the magnetic field and you presumably enter the topological phase, you would see a zero bias conductance peak uh, emerge as you, as you tunnel into the zero energy uh, Majorana bound state. So I want, excuse me, yes. Yuka, yeah. I, I think the picture may be a little bit, I mean, if you really want tunneling, I guess you cannot use the normal region of the wire. You, because that is con conducting. So you need some kind of proper tunneling probe into the ends of the superconducting region. Um, you mean the ground should be no. connected? To no, the no, super no. Or what do you mean? Just how the vol you supply voltage to, you want to tunnel into the ends of that blue region, not through a normal conducting wire, right? Um, yeah, so maybe what I should, uh, what I didn't draw here is a depletion gate near the end of the wire so that you are in fact uh, tunneling. Um, so it's weak tunneling of, okay. uh, so of charge. So you have an insulate, insulator barrier there. Yes, effectively, yes. And I will, in, in the later slides, I will have that. So. Hopefully that will uh, clear things up a little bit. Okay, so um, I won't discuss experiments in great detail. Uh, I just want to comment that progress has been made in both platforms uh, in the nanowires since this uh, famous first observation of uh, zero bias peak in uh, NS transport. Um, the data has improved quite a bit, uh, which is uh, in big part due to materials improvements. In particular, um, the epitaxial interface between the semiconductor and the superconductor aluminum here. Um, in nanowires, there is still, however, uh, lingering questions in the field. For example, whether these zero bias conductance peaks could just be due to accidental zero energy under a bound states. Uh, with the TI platform, these um, presumably uh, topological surface states or boundary states have been successfully proximitized with superconductivity. And ballistic transport, uh, for example, in Joseph's junctions has been uh, seen many times. And uh, here are some examples from uh, Purdue. These systems are mostly studied with superconducting contacts and a particular signature of Majoranas would be this so-called four pi uh, periodic Josephson effect. Uh, which is discussed, for example, in this paper on the right. Uh, many questions remain in the TI platform as well. For example, if you look at the uh, data from this paper, you see that 
the four pi Josephson effect is in fact observed in the in the conduction band and uh, in the band gap, which is presumably around here. So the x axis is uh, backgate voltage or chemical potential. In the band gap, presumably here, you actually see just the conventional two pi periodic Josephson effect. And uh, the band gap is where you would expect the topological states to dominate the transport. So there are still uh, questions remaining here as well. <clears throat> One can also do a different experiment um, with a floating superconductor. Here I'm showing a nanowire device where the superconductor in fact ends here before connecting to the lead. And uh, therefore it forms uh, a tiny island or if you wish uh, a capacitor plate. And um, with these two uh, depletion gates, uh, you can form tunnel barriers here and uh, close off the island. And uh, with the gate in the middle here, you can uh, furthermore control the charge of the island one electron at, at the time. And this effect is known as uh, Coulomb blockade. Uh, even more recently, uh, also double islands were studied. So here you have uh, a single island on the left, then there's a gap uh, in the superconductor again, and you have another island uh, on the right. And um, as far as I know, and people can correct me, there is no experiments showing Coulomb blockade in topological insulator platforms. And I'm not sure what is the, the reason for that. Uh, in any case, for the rest of this talk, I will focus on uh, Coulomb blockaded devices. And the motivation for using Coulomb blockaded devices is that you can make topological qubits which are protected from quasi-particle poisoning from outside by this by a large uh, charging energy. So let me start uh, discussing the Coulomb blockaded uh, islands in more detail. And let's again start from uh, the simplest case of uh, just two Majoranas on the island. The, and here I'm depicting the tunnel barrier gates, which can be used to close off, uh, to deplete this semiconductor here and close off the island. Uh, the Hamiltonian here is a simple uh, capacitor Hamiltonian um, with this total charge offset by a, 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 a gate charge, uh, which is tunable. And I will be writing this Hamiltonian in a slightly different way by introducing charging energy EC, uh, which is just E squared over two times the capacitance. And I denote the, the total charge of the island as a sum of two terms. Um, and also I will introduce a dimensionless gate charge uh, to, to denote the capacitor charge. Um, so, this uh, N12 first is the charge of the Majorana bound state alone. So this charge, uh, this occupation is either zero or one. And in addition to that, there is uh, the charge of the superconducting condensate, which is some even number of, of electrons as it's formed by uh, Cooper pairs. Um, so by labeling the states uh, of the system with these two charges, you can plot the, uh, the energies of this Hamiltonian. They are just a set of parabolas. And what you see is that for a generic uh, gate charge, the system has a unique uh, ground state. So therefore, uh, it is not a topologically protected 
qubit since it doesn't have a ground state degeneracy. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, you need four Majoranas to make a topological qubit. Uh, this is an example of, um, of a topological qubit. Here, since I have four Majoranas, I have two uh, zero energy uh, fermion levels, uh, which each of them can be occupied or empty. And therefore, uh, all of these charge states now will be doubly degenerate because I can put the electron in uh, either the pair one, two, or I can put it in the pair three, four. So I have a ground state degeneracy of two in this case. Uh, um, do you include the uh, uh, repulsion between the islands? Uh, that would be degenerate only if you do have... Uh, do, do you have yeah, so, so here uh, you see I have connected these two islands. I have sort of shorted them by this large uh, superconductor. Um, so this will remove any, any uh, mutual charging energy. Between these, uh, between the two, but in fact, the, um, what you are asking, uh, I will actually discuss it in in the rest of this talk. So I will be next, in fact, removing this uh, superconductor that shorts the the, the two islands. Um, so indeed, today I will discuss. Um, so okay. Before I say, uh, go there, um, I just want to mention that there is lots of interesting physics with these uh, uh, topological qubits and, uh, for example, the interplay of uh, degeneracy and uh, Coulomb energy. Uh, but this is not the topic of today. Uh, today I will discuss something uh, a little bit different going to the direction that uh, Leonid was asking about. Uh, so now I will go to the main topic of, of my talk today, which I call the Majorana charge qubit. Um, the Majorana charge qubit is in fact not topologically protected qubit. Uh, nevertheless, it's a useful stepping stone towards more complex experiments such as a fusion experiment or eventually the full topological qubit. So I will take what I had before and I will just remove this, uh, this connection. So now I have two copies of, of, of these two Majorana islands. I can have a separate gate uh, for each of them. And as was mentioned, uh, so, okay, uh, since I added, uh, since I have two gates now, I will have to uh, use two gate parameters for, for the spectrum. Uh, there is the sort of center of mass mode uh, here, and then there is now the new kind of differential uh, charge mode. And like Leonid mentioned, what used to be a degenerate state uh, here actually now becomes split by this uh, differential mode. And this splitting comes from the mutual uh, charging energy that you have between these uh, two islands. So even though, even though these islands are not tunnel coupled so far, um, I will assume that there is some charging interaction between uh, the two islands, which will split the degeneracy here. Um, the energy spectrum can get quite messy with all these uh, parabolas. So next, I will uh, just plot the ground state charge configuration. So I can label the states um, by two charges. So there's N left, the number of electrons on the left island and uh, correspondingly N right for the right island. And um, in this figure, I'm showing the, the 
the ground state um, as a function of these two uh, gate parameters. And um, most of the time, the ground state is, is unique. Uh, it's only along these lines uh, where the parabolas actually cross, uh, where you have a degeneracy between uh, the neighboring uh, states. And um, if I fix the total charge of this uh, double island, then um, we can uh, move along this uh, differential charge direction, which, and uh, again, you will have, uh, you will have parabolas uh, as, the, as the energy spectrum. And um, here I'm only including the lowest two uh, charge states along, along this line. And I will now add the final ingredient uh, here. Namely, I will include um, a junction between these uh, between these two islands, which allows single electrons to tunnel uh, from, let's say, this Majorana to the next one. And this tunneling can be controlled with uh, with the gate. Uh, a tunnel barrier gate here. Uh, this tunneling is described by this uh, simple Hamiltonian and it leads to an uh, avoided crossing of these two charge states here. And the size of this crossing is uh, given by this uh, Majorana coupling, which I denote by uh, EM. And it can be tunable by by this uh, by this tunnel barrier gate. Um, uh, but Yuka, is NL just the sum of N12 plus NSCL in yes. the previous notation? Yeah, yeah. So it's just the uh, sum of those two. Um, I was confused why you need that two separate thing because your, your superconductor yeah, is Yeah, I, I actually, so. yeah, I, I don't, um, or, Maybe, uh, do you mean uh, previously when I was using uh, two labels for? Yes. Uh, yeah, but... Oh, okay. In this case, you have connected the superconductor. Yeah, so in this case, earlier. I probably need to use two, but yeah, here indeed, I don't actually need two labels. Okay. Uh, I can just use the sum because because NSC is an even number, so uh, I can, yeah, here I would, it would be enough to just use one level, that's right. Okay, so um, this device is indeed a charge qubit. Uh, so it has a excited state and a ground state. It's not topologically protected and um, it's a charge qubit. So the, the frequency of the qubit, this uh, energy uh, difference is in fact uh, quite sensitive to, the, to this gate charge uh, as shown here. So it's, uh, it's what we call uh, a Majorana charge qubit. And next, I will show how to uh, probe this coherent coupling EM in, uh, in charge transport through this device. Um, we can study the qubit by uh, simply attaching normal metal leads to the left and the right. Um, size of the island and then uh, running uh, current through it. So I have added these two junctions uh, on the left and uh, the right. And I denote the tunneling rates of, of single electrons by gamma left and gamma right. And the current that goes through has to of course pass 
through the middle of Majorana Junction as well. And this is the reason why we would expect that the current in some way depends on this uh, coupling EM. Um, <clears throat> even though I made this uh, drawing for the kind of the nanowire setup, you can also do this in the topological insulator system uh, by having uh, just floating uh, superconductors uh, that proximitize the edge of the of the topological insulator. Here, there is maybe a little bit more questions about how to control the the tunnel barrier junctions in the topological insulator case because these uh, boundary states are reflectionless. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, we know that you can you can still uh, just fully deplete the semiconductor here. So that that should, uh, that will maybe work. Another possibility is to use um, a magnetic uh, barrier, but um, there maybe the tunability is, uh, is a question. Um, in any case, um, the theory that I will, is showing is uh, somewhat phenomenological. So it's insensitive to which, uh, which uh, platform you actually will be using. And it's uh, generic in that sense. Um, we focus on the relatively high bias limit, meaning that we can tunnel single electrons uh, into this uh, double island. Uh, so the transport will be sequential tunneling of, of single electrons through the Majorana bound states. And for example, the current may pass in the following way. Uh, suppose we start uh, with the ground state, which is the 1-1 one, one charge state of the, of the double island. Then uh, we can tunnel uh, an incoming electron through the left junction like that, and this will uh, move us to this charge state. And then next we can tunnel an electron out from the right junction, getting us to this charge state. And now finally we can uh, coherently tunnel through the Majoran junction uh, with this coupling EM. And that gets us back to uh, the initial state that we started from. Uh, these two rates, gamma left and gamma right, are incoherent rates, but this EM is a coherent coupling between the two discrete uh, zero energy levels. One can use a different picture to describe the same process uh, with this uh, charge stability diagram. So we start from this one one uh, ground state, and then you kind of complete a cycle. Uh, this picture, of course, is only schematic, meaning that we are not actually tuning these, uh, these gate charges in time. Instead, we just stay at, uh, at this point the whole time. But it's useful to, um, to have this kind of cycle to, to see what the low energy uh, states are which are involved in this uh, in this uh, transport process um, <clears throat> to calculate the current um, we would take the total charge transferred divided by the total time of the process and um, in this process that i showed we transferred a single electron from uh, left to the right. So the numerator is just one E. Um, the total time can be obtained from these uh, rates. So um, for a given rate gamma left, uh, the, the time required is just uh, one over the rate. So in fact, uh, we get this fairly simple expression with uh, the total time in the uh, denominator. Now, uh, this EM is not a rate, it's a 
coherent coupling between the two states. And there is a corresponding rate, uh, which I denote by uh, gamma m here. Uh, this is known as uh, a pseudo rate, and it's related to the coherent coupling in uh, in the following way. So it's it's proportional to the square of the coherent coupling. And there are two other quantities here that I will explain uh, what they are. So here's the current again, uh, and this. Can, 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 yes. can you remind me? Uh... How different that uh, expression would be for just uh, if you just have uh, single electron devices, not runners, but just uh, usual copper boxes? Uh, it would be exactly the same. So if you have um, just single electron device with um, with just one level on the left island and one level on the right island. Uh, and some hybridization EM between those two levels, you would get this exact same current. So this is this so is, so far it's 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 sort of there is no sort of uh, difference whether you, uh, you use uh, Majorana language or uh, electron language. Yes, there is no uh, no difference up to this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you take um, normal islands which have high enough level spacing so that you can uh, discrete, uh, discard, discard the, uh, all the levels except one on each island, then you would, in fact, you would get the same, uh, same, uh, same current and same uh, type, of, type of rate. Um, yeah, so in this pseudo rate, um, this epsilon is, uh, is related to this uh, detuning, this differential uh, gate charge. Now it just has units of energy, so there's the, there's the proper charging energy scale uh, multiplying it. Um, and um, uh, the resonance, so gamma, is the highest when uh, when we are at the degeneracy, so epsilon equals zero corresponds to the uh, what used to be the degenerate point here. Uh, this gamma sigma is the total uh, decoherence rate of, of this uh, qubit. So if you wish, it's a T2 star time. Um, in this simple case where I have no other decoherence mechanism than the couplings to the normal metal leads, uh, this gamma sigma is given by uh, the sum of, of these, two, these two rates. Um, and if you plot this current as a function of uh, the detuning epsilon, you will find uh, a Lorentzian line shape and the width of this Lorentzian in the right limit is given by this coherent EM coupling. And this, uh, this width gives a transport, a DC transport measurement of this, of this coupling EM. And uh, the result is um, similar to um, what you have in superconducting charge qubits. Um, the only difference is that uh, with superconducting charge qubits, uh, all the charges will be 2E rather than uh, 1E, and uh, the EM coupling would be EJ, the Josephson coupling. Um, so with superconducting charge qubits, you can, uh, in fact, you can use superconducting leads and you can have superconducting as wave islands, and then you tunnel uh, two electrons uh, across this central junction and you get a similar result. And as Leonid pointed out, also in normal uh, quantum dots, you can, uh, you will have a analogous 1E uh, result. This, um, 
result where the, um, the width is given by EM requires that this EM is the largest uh, energy scale, meaning that uh, it has to be, EM has to be bigger than the, than the energy scale corresponding to the uh, total decoherence rate. Um, so therefore we need to next estimate this uh, gamma sigma uh, so that we can uh, find the, the lower bound for a measurable EM in, uh, in this kind of device. So next I will discuss the decoherence sources. Uh, since uh, the device is a charge qubit, um, there is definitely uh, decoherence due to uh, extrinsic charge noise. So basically uh, this detuning can have some fluctuations in time which will uh, change the qubit frequency in time and leads to uh, defacing. Um, it's difficult to estimate microscopically the charge noise, but we can include it phenomenologically in, in the model. And I will show later in more detail the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the, work, the inner workings of this uh, model. Uh, what we can estimate microscopically is, um, is decoherence uh, due to intrinsic quasi-particle tunnel, tunneling across this central uh, junction. So in superconductors, we know that there are non-equilibrium quasi-particles which reside uh, at, at energies above the superconducting gap even if the temperature of the system is much less than the superconducting gap. Um, and the source of these quasi-particles is still not, uh, not known, but there seems to be uh, uh, lots of them. Um, and uh, these quasi-particles can uh, cause decoherence because they can uh, tunnel across this central junction, which uh, induces transitions between these two uh, qubit states. And this tunneling rate, we can actually calculate uh, in terms of the device parameters. Um, in particular, what enters here is the, the density of these uh, non-equilibrium quasi-particles these densities are well known in, uh, for example, in aluminum, uh, which we used here. And uh, from these densities, one can estimate um, the, the corresponding uh, rate or energy. And um, we get about uh, 10 micro EV. So any EM coupling, which uh, would be less than 10 micro EV uh, would not be observable uh, in this scenario. Uh, I want to also mention that in this uh, experiment, there was in fact an estimate of the, of the, the T2 star time. And uh, if you translate it to energy, it, uh, it is fairly high corresponding to about 40 micro EVs, uh, the source of decoherence in this case was not known. Uh, it might be uh, due to charge noise, at least naively one would expect that the charge noise might have a, a, a much uh, stronger effect because this, uh, this is a charge qubit after, after all. We can also do a time domain experiment uh, for example, you can uh, apply a voltage pulse to this detuning and then observe coherent oscillations. So basically you initialize in a definite uh, charge state, let's say two zero, and then you uh, apply a pulse uh, bringing uh, suddenly the gate charge close to the resonance for a short time. Uh, as you are at 
the resonance, you will have coherent oscillations in uh, in the prob in the occupation numbers of uh, of these uh, excited start uh, charge states, and then when you bring back the the gate charge to this uh, this value, there is a chance, uh, uh, for example, probably the p one one that the system remains in this excited state uh, one one. And then over time, this excited state will decay back to this uh, two zero state. It will decay by um, by tunneling uh, charge, and in fact, there will be a current associated with this uh, with this decay. Um, and this current can be measured. Um, you can show that the current can be written as. Excuse me. <clears throat> Yeah, current can be written as the, the tunneling rate through the right junction multiplied by the probability to be uh, in either of these two excited states. And if you plot the current uh, shown here, um, current after this pulse, uh, you see that it shows the uh, coherent oscillations which uh, result from the oscillations in these probabilities. And um, this plot is for weak quasi-particle uh, tunneling and no, no charge noise. Uh, in the case of stronger quasi-particle tunneling, uh, still no charge noise, uh, the oscillations uh, get washed out as, as you would expect. Um, this again uh, is essentially a 1E version of the Cooper pair box experiment by Nakamura et al. in uh, in 99, where they observed for the first time coherent oscillations in a in a superconducting uh, charge qubit. Okay, in the remaining. <clears throat> five minutes or so, I will show some of the technical details of, of the actual calculation. So uh, starting with the Hamiltonian, we have the um, charging energy term that I already described. And also each of these islands has um, a set of uh, quasi-particle states, which are above gap. Um, so these are the these would be the uh, excited non-equilibrium quasi-particles that I mentioned. Uh, the two islands are then coupled by uh, a tunneling term. Uh, there is tunneling of uh, of these uh, non-equilibrium quasi-particles, and there is the coherent EM coupling uh, that I mentioned. Finally, there is tunneling between the normal metal leads and the Majorana state uh, on the left and the right. And that's the, the last term here. Um, we ignore some uh, tunneling terms, which I have not written. For example, there can be a pair creation term that uh, creates two quasi-particles on uh, each island, or for example, a term that tunnels from the lead into the quasi-particle state. Um, those terms can be ignored if we assume that the bias voltage is uh, less than the, the superconducting gap um, of the system so that uh, those terms would would be too high in in energy, and we don't have uh, the the bias to to do that. And the temperature is of course also assumed to be lower than uh, than that scale. And uh, a few times I mentioned high bias. So for example, the bias has to be larger than EM and also larger than the relevant 
charging energy so that we can tunnel single electrons into the island. Um, we use um, rate equations with a coherent term to, to calculate the current. So basically we write uh, a reduced density matrix for the slow charge dynamics of the, of the island. So we assume that all the excitations which are not charge excitations, for example, uh, excitations of the quasi-particle spectrum, we assume that those will relax very fast compared to the relaxation of, of charge. And that assumption uh, is valid when these uh, tunneling rates are uh, slow enough. And also that the islands are large enough so that the density of states of quasi-particles, for example, is, is large. Um, we write uh, rate equations for the elements of the density matrix. And for example, when we project to these four uh, charge states shown here, this um, matrix gamma uh, has the following form. And uh, the vector P uh, has six components. So there are four uh, charge, four uh, diagonal components corresponding to the four charge states. And then there are also two of diagonal components, uh, so-called coherences uh, between these, uh, between the two states coupled by the EM term. And you see that the, this EM coherent coupling uh, will couple this, couple to this coherent uh, block of the, of the density matrix. All the other rates um, enter incoherently and can be obtained from the, from the Hamiltonian showing, showed on the previous slide, for example, by using Fermi golden rule. So I think, uh, yeah, and we calculate the steady state current by just uh, imposing a steady state condition and then uh, using those steady state probabilities in the expression for, for current, for example. Um, and similarly, one can study the dynamics, uh, for example, the voltage pulse by using the uh, rate equations. So in conclusion, um, I described this so-called Majorana charge qubit, which is a stepping stone towards more complex experiments. Uh, it has a tunable hybridization, which can be probed in uh, DC and AC transport. And I discussed some decoherence mechanisms. Uh, experimental challenges, uh, most likely charge noise uh, would be the biggest problem since it's a charge qubit. Um, and to put this work into context, um, what we propose here is very similar to the 99 experiment of uh, Nakamura et al. that I mentioned earlier, where they saw these coherent oscillations in a, in a superconducting charge qubit. And uh, from the Nakamura experiment, it took 20 years to, to get to this uh, experiment that I mentioned in the, in the very beginning. So hopefully we can uh, use some of the lessons learned in the superconducting qubits community. And uh, indeed people are already doing that, including myself. And there are many studies, for example, with devices where uh, this, for example, this EM is large enough so that the uh, charge dispersion is, is very weak in the, in the device, making it less susceptible uh, to charge noise and more, to the, more uh, similar to the transmon limit. Uh, so with that optimistic note, I'll acknowledge my collaborators this is the recent paper from, uh, from last night. Uh, we had very useful discussions with these people and uh, here I'm showing some um, other uh, theory works on uh, these Coulomb blockaded 
uh, my own devices. So with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuka. Uh, yeah, maybe you can still have a two or three minutes for questions. There's several questions I'm asking you. Okay, maybe I can clarify a, maybe a big picture type of a question. So I think you mentioned the answer that this Marana chart qubit itself, it's not a topological qubit because you're not really operating in the deep each other has and there's no so yes. topological protection uh, and no is there any other advantage with itself compared to the conventional both the superconductor chart qubit but also uh, we always talk about the same physics with curve for two say single level quantum or whatever so it's also cannot distinguish maybe with that transport um so i'm not sure if i got the question did you say if there is any advantage I guess there are two questions. One is, uh -huh. as a qubit, what's the advantage? I agree with you. It's, this is a useful stepping stone and a measurement device for you know, a lot of other stuff. But itself, um, it's not clear to me what is the advantage. Or maybe I miss something. The second question is, uh, I, I, even as a transport behavior, it's hard to, what's it, what is the signature of actually unique to Miranda? Because you, if I heard correctly, the same transport is for two, just, uh, you know, single level quantum dot. Yeah, so um, I think I agree with you. Um, at least so far, uh, this Majorana charge qubit probably has no advantage compared to regular charge qubits. Uh, the only difference would be uh, compared to regular charge qubit is that we have here uh, a superconducting gap um, above the Majorana levels. So uh, the Majorana levels are separated from the uh, higher energy states by uh, a topological superconducting gap. Um, so there might be some um, some advantage uh, compared to regular charge qubits where the gap is given by some kind of level spacing uh, gap due to confinement. Um, so there might be some something um, something useful there. Maybe also that the superconductor, the fact that we have this. Aluminum, for example, shell. Uh, maybe it's um, maybe it's uh, screening uh, properties are better than uh, uh, what you have in regular uh, charge qubits. But that's uh, that's just uh, speculation. Um, the second question. Uh, what was it again? The second question. I think I forgot. The second question is the transport behavior. You oh, the transport, is, yes. It's Whether not unique it's... to Marana, I guess. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably not uh, indeed unique to Majoranas. Um, and one can think of um, if there is um, a way to improve on that. Uh, so I think to, to have something unique to, to Majoranas, uh, you, would, you would want to um, study uh, probably lower bias voltage. So the scenario where you are not in the sequential tunneling limit um, so that you can show that um, the low energy state on the left side of the island and and the right side of the island are in fact the same uh, same level. Uh, so I think um, I think to demonstrate that you would probably need to look at co-tunneling uh, transport, and uh, that's maybe a, a an interesting future direction for uh, for this device. You can also look at superconducting uh, leads. 
uh, which which may be another which uh, we have actually looked at, and uh, that's maybe another uh, uh, another approach. Would that set some limit on the um, length of the wires so you don't lift the degeneracy? Can you estimate that so that they actually the levels actually stay at, at zero? Um, so, so that length um, would be the same uh, length scale that you have in a single uh, topological wire. So you uh, you want the the two Majoranas uh, to be far enough uh, apart. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, you, you, that's what I'm asking. You want them to be far enough apart. I'm just asking what, what that length mm -hmm. scale is. And yeah, so yeah, it depends on the specific uh, uh, device, whether it's topological insulator or, or the, or the nanowire. So I think that, yeah, that can depend on the microscopic, microscopic details. If indium arsenide slash aluminum, what is the order method of that? Um, well, I think the hope is that uh, it can be a few hundred uh, nanometers. So that if you have, let's say, a one micron long uh, wire, then this would have already uh, basically negligible uh, splitting between the myrans. So that length scale is compared to say the, the coherence length, is that what you're? Uh... Yeah, so it depends on the uh, super, the topological gap. So mm -hmm. uh, the gap separating the Majoranas from the continuum. Um, that, um, so it's the velocity, uh, the relevant uh, velocity of the semiconductor divided by that, by that uh, gap. And it can also depend on the uh, disorder in the wire. Uh, disorder will certainly make it make it worse. Uh, okay. If there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much, Yuka. Again, thanks. A very interesting talk. And I think next week, instead of a regular seminar, we actually have a mini, actually two mini workshops featuring the PQC funded uh, seed grant project and also some jury uh, projects. So just watch out the email from David. So thank you very, very much, everyone, for watching. Thanks. Thank you.